Hello guys and dolls, welcome back to Honey Badger 3D Print and Paint. Today we are taking a look at the Aquila D1. Before we get started, roll those credits. Okay, so the Aquila D1 scores on the doors. 235 by 235 by 250 on the Z. It is 399 US dollars. It has linear rails on the X, dual linear rails on the Y. Um, it has two lead screws on the Z that have a synchronization belt, but it does not have two Z motors. There is one Z motor, two Z screws. Um, it has a direct drive hot end, which has got this cover over it. It has a touch screen. Other than that, there's nothing wildly exciting about this machine, if I'm perfectly honest. There's nothing that sets my world on fire. But at the same time, it is relatively feature rich. It does have an inductive sensor um, for automatic bed leveling. You can tension the belts on X and Y. Um, it does have a removable um, spring steel textured sheet. Uh, it does have a filament runout sensor. So to be clear, Voxel Lab did send us this machine to review. However, they did not pay us for the review and the thoughts and opinions that are expressed in this video are our own, not those of Voxel Lab. Okay, this is us telling you what we think of this machine. We'll take a look at prints in a moment. I'm going to start off by saying that actually this machine does print really quite nicely. Um, it's very easy to set up. It's very easy to use. There are a couple of things on it that feel a little bit less polished. So the touch screen on the machine, it's a little bit clunky. Um, it, it does, it's not super reactive. Um, I think the thing that surprised me the most was actually the footprint of this machine. So I took, I took my Sidewinder X1 off of the bench and put this in its place and it takes up exactly the same amount of space as my Sidewinder X1. It's got this X motor on the side, it's got this X uh, adjustment on, the, on this side and the screen is stuck off at the side as well. And I mean, it's just, it, uh, it surprised me that ultimately this machine at a sort of 230 build volume is, uh, is, is taking up the same amount of space as a 300 by 300 by 400 Sidewinder. Um, there is a filament spool holder up the top. Um, I will be, just to be clear, we don't use these filament spool holders. So we have a rack of filament that sits above our printers. Um, I don't agree with putting that extra weight up on top of these machines. Um, you do have to have the spool mounted up the top because that's where the filament sensor is. And the filament sensor actually goes down through the frame. So you can't really, um, you can't really sort of, you couldn't relocate this. The filament has to come in from the top. Um, the direct drive extruder goes up to 300 degrees. It is a very capable extruder. Frankly, once you take the cover off, it's super similar to a Sprite. Um, one thing that does annoy me is they have chosen to put the, um, to put the power cord on the side, um, which means that when you're putting it in a space, you have to bend your power cord round to go in the side. Don't really know why you would do that, Power cords come out of the back so that I can run all my leads down back behind where my workbench is. Don't really want it on the side. I, I, I don't know why it's there. It's a little bit more convenient, I suppose, because I've got, or at least to have the, the power on and off switch on the side. Um, but I don't, want my my, I don't want my kettle cord to plug into the side of my machine. It creates a lot of issues for me when I'm working in my workspace. A personal gripe, but a gripe nonetheless. Um, Let's take a look at some models and we'll show you what the build quality looks like. Okay, so most of these prints are done in IWE Colors dual color filament. It's a silk filament, so it really shows up layer lines if and when we do them. And then this benching is done in 
eSuns PLA Plus. So, you can see on this Benchy that what we have here is a pretty good Benchy. Some layer lines on the bow, a pretty good finish on the surface there. Um, we did get a little bit of an issue on the back. There we go, we've got a little bit of an issue on the back there. The bridging isn't terrible. It's an acceptable Benchy. Um, this took an hour and 20 minutes on 60 millimeters a second, so I'm not sure what the acceleration on this printer is, but it's clearly not high. We come on to the next test. So this is a pyramid that tests bridging. You can see that here it's printing completely in midair between these points, and we'd be lying if we said this had done a particularly good job. Um, you can see there's an awful lot of of drooping there. This is purely and simply a part cooling issue. Um, and again, frankly, there's not gonna be a lot you're gonna be able to do about that on this machine. We then have the fractal pyramid. So this was a pyramid from Thingiverse. This came out really cool just because of the type of filament that we used. So because we used that IWE color um, filament, this fractal pyramid came out looking really awesome. You can see how that color shifts in the light there. And it did a pr pretty fair job of this. So there's not really, and there's a little bit of wispiness here and there. Retraction probably needs to be tweaked a bit. But for an out of the box printer with an out of the box profile, this is pretty good. I think one of the things people aren't necessarily gonna like is the texture that's on the bottom of this. It's quite a pronounced texture. Um, and in the end, we actually had to use um, we actually had to use 3D lac because we were having some bed adhesion issues. So um, so really, there we go. So really, it's a good it's a good pyramid. It's a good print, but yeah. So then we come on to the Flexi Dragon. So this came out really nicely. Everything on it printed. All of the fins came out really nicely. Everything moves nice and loose, nice and free. And in this filament, it just looks really cool. The way that it shifts colors in the light and the way that it came out, really, really good. Again, that texture finish on the bottom, I think actually works quite well on this print. Looks really good. And then finally, we found this vase. So this vase actually has two layers, on one on the outside, one on the inside, of this sort of fractal design. And then it's smooth around the outside. So I really like the way, again, that the uh, IWE color managed to do this. There was a small fail down in this corner here. I'm sure you can see that, where that bit just didn't come out properly. Um, and on this, I'm sure you can see there, there's quite a pronounced Z seam. So what that points to me is that retraction out of the box on the profile really isn't where it needs to be. And we'd need to do some retraction tests to be able to tune that out and, and sort of get that to a good place. But I think that's a really cool effect. It came out really nice. And the smoothness on the side walls of this are absolutely bang on. So as you can see, the printer is very capable. Out of the box with, um, with a Cura profile, pretty much stock. We changed flow rate from 100 to 101. And other than that, um, these are stock settings. These all printed at 60 millimeters a second. Uh, the part cooling is fine. Uh, the extrusion flow rate is fine. The bed level is pretty good. Um, you could push this, because this has got linear rails, you could push this faster. You could absolutely push it faster. Um, and, uh, and, and it will go at a decent, at a decent speed. Um, we just left it at the stock settings so we could show you what it would be like printing out of the box. And as you can see, it's pretty capable. One annoying thing is that the mini SD card on the front you have a tendency to, um, to, when you're trying to push it in, to push it in the gap between the uh, where the actual SD card slot is. I really felt like we'd moved past that as a hobby at this point. You know, the amount of SD cards that I lost inside of original Ender 3s is a lot. <laughs> you accidentally posted it into the, uh, into the control box and you were like, oh, God. 
and it was just easier to get another SD card than it was to open up the machine and try and get it out. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I feel like that's a bit of a design flaw. Look, the reality is, is there's a reason why on this channel we generally tell you to get an Ender 3 Pro as your first machine. And that is that it's easy to work on, it's easy to repair, there's not a steep learning curve, it does what it needs to do. This does what it needs to do, but this isn't easy to repair, and this isn't easy to work on. So there's obviously no adjustment in the rails um, because they're linear rails. So if there is any slop, now there isn't any in mine, but if there is any slop in yours where the linear rail moves, tough. You cannot do anything about it. You cannot adjust linear rails that way. So if you get one and it doesn't do that, great. If you get one and it does do it, nothing you can do. Um, I will say that it goes together very easily. We did a live stream on this. Um, you know, it's 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 two or three bolts, the screen bolts on, and then you're and then you're pretty much good to go. The auto bed level works pretty well. Um, I think we've got ours set to um, three two five or minus three two five. Sorry for the Z offset. It's about right um, and works really well. Pretty easy to level the bed. You do still have leveling knobs, so what you have to do is. You go around all four corners and you level the build plate to the nozzle and then you go and do the Z offset. It's kind of an it's kind of annoying that you have to do that. Um, I would like to have seen this bed fixed in place from factory as level and just have the auto level go around and create a mesh. Um, this feels like there's extra steps to that. A lot of people when they get their first machine, bed leveling is probably one of the most daunting parts of um, of, of 3D printing. Um, you'll go onto groups and you'll try and ask about it and you'll have one person who always shouts at you and says, it's called tramming, not bed leveling or whatever. And, oh, yeah, I can do it with a piece of paper. I can do it by eye. I do it by just crying onto my build plate and making sure it doesn't touch the tears or whatever. This is relatively easy to level, but there's just that extra step of having to go round and do that. So just annoying more than anything else. Um, other than that, I don't think there's much really to say about this machine. It does what it says on the tin. I would like to have seen a second Z motor rather than just a second Z rod. Um, I would have probably liked to, to have seen um, inductive sensors for the um, for the end stops rather than rather than physical clicky ones. But again, the problem is is that this machine is sub four hundred pounds. It's an entry level machine. It's got full linear rails. You know you need to make some concessions. The machine does what it needs to do. As you can see, it prints very acceptably. Um, one thing I would say is that, frankly, I don't think this machine is going to be particularly easy to modify. So, like, if you weren't happy with the part cooling, you can see from the pyramid that, um, that the part cooling and doing bridging isn't amazing. Um, this is going to be a contextually irritating machine to try and modify. Um, normally, with Ender 3 clone style machines, pretty much anything that will fit on Ender 3 will fit on this. This is kind of a clone of an S1, or at least that's its most sort of similar competitor. Um, most of what fits on a Sprite extruder isn't going to fit on this. So it, it doesn't really, I don't really think it works the same way, um, which means you're going to have to have people who specifically have this machine and have done modifications for it to try and improve that part calling. Um, and I just think you're going to be limited by some of that. It's a good starter machine. Um, once it is set up, it really doesn't need a lot of playing about with. People can just use it and it will turn out pretty good quality parts. Um, they won't be amazing, but this isn't a Bamboo Labs, you know, this isn't a Prusa. This is a sub £400 machine and it does what it says on the tin. So scores on the doors. I would give this a solid 8 out of 10. 8 out of 10 because, frankly, it does a good job. There's some features I would like to see, but again, the more things you add to it, the more you drive the price up. It's a solid machine for someone who is starting out. It does what it needs to. 
And there's really not much more to say about it than that. So there is a link in the video description to Voxel Lab to check out some of their deals. They currently have Black Friday deals on. They're running for a while, depending on when you're watching this video. Depends on whether or not those deals will be there. Um, but also, there, you know, that's not an affiliate link. We don't get any kickbacks from um, from buying it. If you want to go and get one, it will do the job that you probably that you need it to do. Okay. So don't forget to like and subscribe. We'll catch you on the next one.